Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. It's been dubbed a war on whistleblowers. The Obama administration has aggressively gone after whistleblowers in an unprecedented fashion. President Obama has used the Espionage Act against whistleblowers more than every other president combined. Now joining us in studio to discuss this heightened attack against whistleblowers is a whistleblower herself, Marsha Coleman at a Bayou. She was a senior policy analyst at the Environmental Protection Agency when she blew the whistle on how American-owned Valladium mines were poisoning residents of a town in South Africa. She then sued the EPA on the basis of race, sex, color discrimination, and a hostile work environment, and she won. Her case sparked the drafting and eventual passage of the No Fear Act in 2002, which discourages federal managers and supervisors from engaging in unlawful discrimination and retaliation. It's an honor having you in studio, Marsha. Thank you very much. And I should mention, Marsha, you also have a book titled No Fear, A Whistleblower's Triumph Over Corruption and Retaliation at the EPA. Yes. And um, we kind of just want to get into the book mm -hmm. and talk about your case. Can you just briefly tell us um, what happened? You, you were a senior policy analyst at the EPA. Right. Then you discovered this U.S. mining company was, was basically poisoning residents mm -hmm. in South Africa. How did this come to your attention? Well, uh, when Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa, the United States government and the South African government decided um, to, to, to develop a bilateral commission called the U.S.-South Africa Binational Commission, or it's dubbed the Gore and Becky Commission. And it was the goal of this commission that um, that the United it was, the goal of the commission was to allow the United States government to assist a newly formed South African government to um, to work on a number of different issues, everything from agriculture to um, environment to commerce. And so my job was to work with the newly formed Mandela government in the area of environmental protection. And so my job was to transfer technology and knowledge and, and, and best practices, um, at least their U.S. experience, to the South Africans and to determine how we could assist them. Okay. And you sort of, we were discussing this off camera, you were sort of like a Trojan horse. You described your presence there. Can you, can you explain that a bit more? Certainly. So my job was to work with, with the ANC leadership, essentially, in the new government. And as a part of that process, I found out um, that a U.S. multinational corporation was involved in unsafe working conditions uh, in a U.S.-owned mine in South Africa that mines a substance called vanadium pentoxide. Now, vanadium pentoxide is at the is is really at the at the at the it's at the base of 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 how we run our country and this how we run this country and why this country operates um, because the United States government and and industrial society in general is based on a framework of steel if you look at your buildings uh, technologies in terms of surgical equipment cars trucks it's really built on a base of steel Vanadium is an alloy, so it's a substance that when you pour it, when you mix it with steel, it provides steel with flexibilities so that the steel would not, would not crack when it's, under, when it's under pressure, either hot and cold pressures or just extreme temperatures. So, so, that it's, it's in, so Henry Ford, for example, had a problem with the, with the Model T in Detroit because Detroit is an environment where we have very hot uh, environments and very cold environments and the steel kept cracking in the Model T. And through his communications with a French scientist, he found out that if he mixed vanadium in with the steel, that, the car, that they, they would provide the steel with the flexibility uh, to withstand both hot and cold situations. So, so, you, and so, so our, our, our armament, our weaponry systems, televisions, airplanes, forks, knives, everything that we use in this country that has steel in it, comes from this small community in South Africa that produces vanadium pentoxide. So this is a multi-billion dollar inter industry we're talking about. This, this oh, absolutely, absolutely. The, there are a number of papers, particularly CIA papers, that we've been able to have access to, which actually note that vanadium is a substance that the United States government would be willing to commit war 
um, to, in order to make sure that the U.S. government had access to this substance. Wow, commit war. So when you approach your supervisors and you let on that you have found there to be this, the poisoning of these residents, um, they basically told you to shut up. No, no, it wasn't basically told me to shut up. I was told to shut up. And then I was actually told, you know, look, you know, you've got this great position. You know, why do you want to worry about every poor African on the continent? Um, why don't you spend your time decorating your office? Wow. Uh, and so um, clearly that was really the first salvo, I think, um, that I should have known that something was wrong um, because th it was such an outrageous statement to make to a senior policymaker. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, what you do is you try just to go to another person and, and sort of navigate through the system. And every single door I went to, it was just shutting in my face. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that we have to be concerned about is this rotating door between industry and government. Because you have a lot of people going into government um, to, uh, to, to gather the con contacts and to sort of do their sort of outreach. And then, of course, they leave government. They go back into private sector. But while they're in government, they're still operating as someone from the private sector. And in my office, that was, not, that was, that was, that was the same situation. Okay. So that we had a lot of people who had come in from the extractive industries who were actually in my office. So that when I started talking about vanadium pentoxide poisoning, they understood exactly what I was talking about, even though at the time I didn't. I understand. So what, how would you describe the culture then? I mean, I, I know you've said in the past that you've equated it to a 20th century plantation. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, when I first arrived at EPA, there were very few black professionals. And so we were, in, in a sense, the first generation of black professionals at the EPA. And, and the culture was such that, yeah, I mean, we understand by law we have to have black professionals at the table but we certainly don't expect you to say anything. And so we kept, you know, sort of hitting this green door where people would, you know, would look at us like, you know, why, who invited you to, to say anything at the meeting? You're supposed to just sit there uh, as, as a token. Um, and so we had a lot of problems, particularly when it came to issues that we were so passionate about, like Africa, the Caribbean, um, global warming, the issues that really impact our community, you know, neurotoxic levels of lead in the brain of young black kids. Uh, we wanted to make our contributions, and we were determined to do that. And every step of the way, uh, we were being smacked down. And the EPA, I know, has been also equated to sort of this mafia, this like shadow organization. And, and it's interesting because I think the impression that a lot of people have of the EPA is they're safeguarding our our water and, you know, our environment, and this is one of those great agencies that we should really be champion, but you're saying the culture in there is, doesn't reflect that it's, at all. It's, it's very much a corporate culture, and when I first arrived at EPA, it was not unusual um, to have someone from Dow Chemical sitting at a desk in the corner in the same office that you were in, uh, who was also writing environmental policy. Um, and so, you know, for a while it took me a while to sort of, you know, get a handle on who was a government official and who was from the private sector in the very office. And so, you know, I'm sure you've read a lot of history of EPA where, in fact, there have been congressional hearings about industry leaders actually writing environmental policy, sending it to EPA for their comments, and then EPA promulgating those as rules. So it took a while for me to understand that this agency, in terms of a Trojan horse, um, that, in fact, there was very little difference between uh, corporate interests, uh, interests of the pesticides industry, interests, you know, um, you know, the mineral extractive industries, and what was happening at EPA. And whenever there was a conflict uh, between what was good for industry and what was good for the people, industry almost always won. Industry almost always, always won. won. Almost always won. Okay. And you battled with the EPA for many years, but right. it, but you're actually still battling with yeah, the e EPA, even yeah. though your lawsuit is yeah. over. Can you just fill, fill us in on what's happening? Well, I now? won the largest lawsuit ever against the EPA because the treatment um, that I received was, um, was so, in many ways, unbelievable for people. I mean, I was called, um, you know, every... Um, 
you know, racial name that you can imagine. I was called every sexual name that you can imagine. And oftentimes it was in open meetings. So that there were so many witnesses uh, around when people were calling me these horrible names. Uh, and, then, and then when I refused to um, submit or become intimidated, um, then the agency started really ratcheting up the intimidation. I started getting threatening calls at my desk, particularly the closer I got to trial. Like, you know, don't be surprised when you put your foot on the pedal when you turn on your ignition, you get a big bang. Um, um, there was a call at my house once. Um, someone described what my, I think it was my son was wearing outside my house. Um, so the intimidation was uh, was was pretty terrifying, um, and and so so through it all, you know, I made a decision, uh, as I think all whistleblowers do, um, that this was not the country I wanted to live in unless it had the potential to change, and and so we started on this process of winning the lawsuit, um, which I did, and then after I won, and I won pretty big. Uh, and I won so big, at least that everyone had to pay attention to it. And I wouldn't say heads roll, because as you probably know, that when you lose a lawsuit at EPA, the other message they send to managers is that we will protect you. Mm. And so all the managers were promoted, uh, who I named in my lawsuit. They were all promoted? They were all promoted. Who? Yeah, they were all promoted. Um, but nevertheless, Congress convened two hearings, and a law was introduced and eventually passed which became the first civil rights and whistleblower law of the 21st century, um, called No Fear. Mm -hmm. And that really is what it's going to take uh, for people to take on this system. Um, and no fear doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It just means that you don't allow fear to stop you from doing what you need to do. Yes, yes. But the EPA now is asking for your emails um, because you wrote this revealing book and things of that nature. Right, exactly. Well, um, after I won my lawsuit, um, a couple years later, EPA fired me. And when you think about it, they really did have to fire me because they could not allow that kind of victory to stay on the books at EPA in fear that other people might try to emulate what I did. And so they absolutely, I think, in, in their own twisted way, had to sort of, uh, the end of it, for them, the end, this book ended with the firing of Marsha Coleman Adebayo. Uh, and so I decided that that was not my particular ending. And so I filed another suit uh, against the EPA on the basis of firing me for engaging in protected activity. And so we're winding our way through the court system. It's now like the 13th year since I filed that lawsuit. Um, and um, and so we, I think we'll we'll probably go to court uh, March 2014, but in the process of going to court, EPA has now ordered me to answer deposition questions, and of course the questions that they're asking me have absolutely nothing to do with the lawsuit, and so they're asking me questions um, like who helped you write your book or did mm. someone help you write your book, and if did you talk to anyone who uh, while you were in the process of writing your book. And if you did, name that person, provide their contact information, um, provide the names of anyone you spoke to uh, when you wrote your book. So what they're trying to build is like a pyramid of everyone that I spoke to and worked with as I, uh, as I, wrote, as I wrote the book. And that's a way of intimidating not just me, but intimidating everyone that I, that I work with. Okay, well, Marsha, please hang tight. We are going to have part two of this conversation with Marsha Coleman at Abayu. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.